Welcome to lecture F, Advanced Concepts in Cache Memory, set 1. We have already learned about concepts in cache memory and optimization techniques in cache memory, both at basic level and at advanced level. To get a clearer picture of what happens in cache memory, we have prepared a set of numerical problem solving session in today's video, such that working out with these examples and design problems will give you more conceptual clarity. After this, there is one more video planned on advanced concepts in cache memory 2 with little higher level order thinking questions. I am sure that this numerical problem solving session would be an interesting learning takeaway for all of you. So, assume a two level cache system with the following specifications. L1 hit time is 1 cycle, L1 miss rate is 2.5 percentage, the hit time of L2 cache is 6 cycles and with a 17 percent of miss rate. This 17 percent is defined as percentage L1 misses that miss in L2. Now, miss penalty of L2 is 120 cycles, compute average memory access time. We know that average memory access time is defined as hit time plus miss rate into miss penalty. Now, this miss penalty of L1 again should be defined as hit time of L2 plus miss rate of L2 into miss penalty of L2. So, average memory access time is defined as hit time of L1 cache plus miss rate of L1 cache into miss penalty and uh, this miss penalty is itself again going into one more iteration that is hit time of L2 plus miss rate of L2 into miss penalty. Since all the values are given, the hit time of L1 is given with uh, 1 cycle, so that is 1, miss rate of L1 that is 2.5 percentage. So, here the value is uh, 0 0.025, that is uh, the miss rate of L1 cache plus the hit time is 6 cycles for L2 cache with a 17 percent miss rate, so 0 0.17 into 120 clock cycles that is equal to 1.66 clock cycles is the average memory access time. Moving into the next question, it is an optimization problem. A cache has access time, there is a heat latency of 10 nanosecond and a miss rate of 5 percent. An optimization was made to reduce the miss rate to 3 percent. So, from 5 percent, you are trying to reduce the miss rate to 3 percent, but the heat latency was increased. So, on this optimization, we are able to reduce the miss rate but the byproduct of which is there is an increase in the hit time from 10 nanosecond to 15 nanosecond. Under what condition this change will result in better performance or lower memory access time? So, in this particular problem, we are talking about a cache memory with some features of hit time and miss rate and trying to make some optimizations that we have seen in few of the lecture videos like increasing block size, then increasing cache size, then associativity. So, different ways by which we could reduce your miss rate. But some of these optimizations you know that it uh, will impact some other cache parameter like the hit time. This is the classical example wherein the hit time is increased. So, we have to see whether such a kind of an optimization is useful or not. And the term usefulness is subjective. Here in this context, we are considering average memory access time as one of the parameter. So, with this optimization, can we reduce average memory access time? So, average memory access time of the first case is defined as hit time of uh, the cache plus miss rate into miss penalty. So, here it is defined as hit time is 10 nanosecond and miss rate is 0 0.05 and average memory access time of the second one is defined as hit time plus miss rate into miss penalty where hit time is increased from 10 nanosecond all the way to 15 nanosecond. So, that is an increase here whereas the miss rate comes from 5 percent to 3 percent. So, what we are trying to do here is average memory access time of the second one that is the optimized one should be less than average memory access time of the first case then only we can say that this optimization has resulted in a better performance. So, 15 plus 0 0.03 into miss penalty that is the average memory access time of the second one should be less than 
that is the first one 10 plus 0 0.05 into miss penalty and upon solving you get that the miss penalty value should be larger than 250 nanosecond if at all this equation has to hold. So, this optimization will work only in the context when the miss penalty is larger than 250 nanosecond. So, when the miss penalty is smaller than 250 nanosecond, even though we are able to reduce the miss rate, the product of miss rate into miss penalty is not sufficient enough to overcome whatever increase that you have in the hit time. We now move into the next question. A cache has a hit rate of 95 percent, a block size of 128 byte, cache hit latency of 5 nanosecond. Main memory take 50 nanosecond to return the first word. So, here one word is defined as 32 bits. So, it takes 50 nanosecond to return the first word of a block and 10 nanosecond for each subsequent word. What is the miss latency of the cache? That is the first question. If doubling the cache block size reduces the miss rate to 3 percent, does it reduce average memory access time? So, there are through different versions of the question. So, the hit rate is defined as 95 and we have 128 byte blocks and cache hit latency of 5 nanosecond. So, the values have been substituted down, hit rate of 0 0.95, block size of 128 byte, hit time of 5 nanosecond. One word is defined as 4 byte, so it is 32 bits that is being given in the question, 32 byte, sorry 32 bit is one word. So, number of words that you can accommodate in a wall, in a block, words per block is 128 byte divided by 4 bytes. So, you get 32 words are there in one block. Now, the miss penalty has been defined as for the first word, it takes lot of time because you have to index into the memory. So, it takes 50 nanosecond to return the first word. So, first word will take 50. We know that there are total of 32 words out of which the first word can be brought only in 50 nanosecond. Remaining 31 words will take 10 nanosecond each. So, that is going to take total of 360 nanosecond. So, what is average memory access time? You have hit time with you that is 5, miss rate is given as 0 0.05 and then miss penalty is 360 that we just computed. So, we will get 23 nanosecond as the average memory access time. Now, the second portion of the question is if doubling the cache block size reduce the miss rate to 3 percent, does it reduce average memory access time? Let us imagine that the hit time is unaffected since it is not given in the question. So, in the second case since the block size previously we had 6, 128 byte block. Now, that is going to be increased to 256 byte block. So, the number of words that you have is now 256 byte divided by 4 bytes. So, you have 64 words. Now, miss penalty is defined as the first word will take 50 nanosecond. Thereafter, you have 63 more words. Each will take 10 nanosecond each. So, totally the miss penalty is 680 nanosecond. So, average memory access time in the second case that is by increasing the block size is going to be 25.4 nanosecond. 5 that is a hit time plus miss rate is 0 0.03 only and then 680 is the miss penalty. So, it is 25.4 nanosecond. So, doubling the block size will not reduce average memory access time. That is a takeaway that you have. So, this is a classical example of a case wherein the block size is increased. When you increase the block size, then we are trying to reduce compulsory misses. So, that is reflected in this question from 5 percent your miss rate has come down all the way to 3 percent. But when the block size is increased, you have to bring multiple words from the next level of memory into cache. That is been reflected as we discussed in this question. The miss penalty value is increasing. So, the increase in miss penalty is more dominant than the reduction in the miss rate. Thereby, the average memory access time of the second version that is the cache block doubled version is larger than that of the previous one. Thereby, the optimization is not effective. Now, we are moving into a question where cache memory mapping by the operating system is being discussed. A 16 KB direct mapped 256 byte block unified cache. Unified cache means both I and D, both instruction and data is stored in one cache that is called unified cache 
is attached to 16 MB main memory system. The word length as well as the instruction length of the processor is 16 bytes. So, each of your instruction, each of your data word is 2 bytes. Consider a program that consists of a main routine M, which in turn calls a subroutine S. M consists of 12 instruction words which are loaded in the main memory from the address 0x4230FA onwards. So, you have two subroutines M and S, that is M is a main routine and S is a subroutine. M is stored from this particular address. The last five instructions of M is a loop that is iterated 10 times. The second instruction in the loop is a call to the subroutine S. S consists of four instruction words loaded in the main memory from the address 0x70F168. The last instruction of S is a subroutine returned back to M. The only two data words that are being used by M and S are at addresses 0x74074 and 0x846064. Assume that caches are initially empty and we have to ignore all OS level interruption and subsequent cache impact on context switching. Let us try to understand what is being given in this question. You have been defined that you are going to store a main program M and a subroutine S, these are going to interact. Now, the specification of M is being given from which address the M is stored in main memory and we know that the last five instructions of M are going to be repeated in a loop and the second instruction is a call statement to S. So, M calls S and S is returning back to M. So, it is a main function which in turn call a subroutine and this subroutine call happens 10 times inside a loop. So, during the execution of the program, since the cache is initially empty, upon demand, contents are loaded to cache from the main memory. Both instruction and data are stored in the same cache, it is a unified cache. After the execution is done, we are supposed to tell what are the non-empty sets in the cache. So, the first thing is, we wanted to find out what is the specification of the cache. So, we know that it is a 16 KB direct mapped 256 byte block. So, it is 16 KB direct mapped cache with 256 byte blocks. So, the number of sets in the cache is defined as cache size by block size into associativity and cache size is 16 KB. So, it is 2 power 14 divided by 2 power 8 that is block size into associativity is 1. So, that gives you 2 power 6 and we have 64 sets that is there in the cache. And these sets are numbered from 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. up to 63. So, whenever I talk about my cache memory, then the sets are set 0, set 1, set 2, etc. up to 63. So, by virtue of it, you know that we are going to have a main memory which require 24 bits that is 16 MB main memory 2 power 24. Out of it since we have 64 sets 6 bit is gone for index and our block size is 256 bytes. So, 8 bits are gone for the offset that makes it total of 14 and remaining 10 bit is your tag. So, this is the logic in which we are able to get the split up of the physical address, 24 bit of physical address that is 16 MB of main memory that is given in the question, 24 bits of physical address gets split up into most significant 10 bits for tag, and then 6 bits for index and the last 8 bits for the offset. Now, the next thing what uh, we want to know is where this main program M and the subroutine S is being organized. So, as given in this question, it was told that the main function is stored in location 4230FA and each of the instruction will take 2 byte. Each instruction as well as data word is 2 byte. So, 4230FA and 4230FB, these are the 2 bytes in which the first instruction is located or first instruction is rather spread across 2 memory bytes 0x. 4230FA and FB. 
So at Fc, we have the next instruction. So the instruction is stored in continuous locations. So Fa, Fc, Fe. Once Fe is over, the very next one is 0x42310, zero zero zero, then 0204060808, 0e, and then we have 10. So these are the 12 instructions for the main program M. Similarly, your subroutine is being stored in 707168. So, 68, 6A, 6C and 6E. Each instruction will take 2 bytes. So, these are the bytes in which these instructions are starting. So, the 4 instructions of subroutine S are kept like this. So, now we have to understand what is a program flow. It is given in the question that the last 5 lines of M is part of a loop. So, from M8, M9, M10, M11 and M12 that is being shown here, this is going to be iterated 10 times. And the second line of this loop that is M9 is a function called to subroutine S and the last line of subroutine is a function returned back to M. So, in a subroutine, when M9 calls the subroutine S, the return statement from S will trigger M10 that is a balance that is happening. And the two data items that is being referred are 0x74807484064. So, now we got a complete picture of what are the addresses that are needed in order to execute this M and S along with their data. Now, if you take this address 0x4230 FA, we know that the last 8 bits which is represented by FA, hexadecimal FA, that is the last 8 bit, they belong to offset. Out of these 3 0, even though this 3 0 is 8 bit, the 6 bits will tell you the index. So, when I write 3 0, 3 correspond to 0 0 1 1 and 0 correspond to 0 0 0 0. So, these are the 8 bits that is there. You extract the 6 bits, this will tell you the value is 48. So, this particular location that is 0x30FA that is address in the main memory upon bringing to cache to an empty cache, it will be kept in set number 48. If you look at the next one also, so when you bring set number 48, everything with the offset value, the last value that is 4230 and 4230FF this constitute of 256 bytes, that much amount of data is being brought together to set number 48. So, in that process, M1, M2 and M3, these three will already be brought. So, you encounter a miss upon fetching M1, but M2 and M3 are, are automatically brought to the cache during the miss of M1, because they are part of the same block. But when you go to M4, it is actually 31. So, 31 means it will be 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. That indicates these 6 bits will point to set number 49. So, this is going to be set number 49. And all others, where else, where else you have this 31, this, this whole set will be part of set number 49. So, on M4, we have one more miss that will result in bringing off the contents of 423100 to 4231 FF, 256 bytes are being brought. In the 256 byte, M4 to M12 is completely contained, so they will be brought to set number 49. But at when you are fetching and executing M9, in the meantime, control is transferred to 707168, that is the address that is going to be worked out at this point. Let us try to work it out and then see to which address to, or to which cache memory set this particular address is mapping. So, 0x707168. So, this is the offset portion. So, you expand 71. 7 stands for 111, 0111 and 1 is 0001. So, if you extract the 6 bits of it, that is actually pointing to again set number 49. This is the interesting observation that you see from this question. 
when you are going to bring s they all are part of that 71 so they all map to set number 49 it's a direct map to cache so m4 up to m12 whereas the complete s they both are mapped to set number 49 so m4 to m12 and s cannot coexist together it's a direct map to cache where this part of the main routine as well as the subroutine they are mapped into the same set because of which when the main routine is existing in the cache then the subroutine is been evicted out when you transfer the control back to the main routine that is when you wanted to execute m10 then i will evict out the subroutine like that when the control again is passing on to s that is when the loop is repeated from m12 to m8 and in m9 we have one more control at that time s is not present so it's again a miss so that is going to evict out m and then it is going to bring back s so in this way there is a mutual eviction because of the address peculiarity so based upon that we can find that wherever you see that red color they are telling which is the set number to which these addresses are mapped so you have 48 and 49 that is part of m whereas your s is mapped to set number 49 only and two data elements the first one is mapped to set 0 and second one is mapped to set 16. So, both the data elements, there is no conflict, they both will be residing in this cache from the beginning. So, except the first two compulsory miss, like when you encounter these data items for the very first time, there is a compulsory miss, and here after that, nobody is going to pull them out. So, find the number of cache miss occurred during the execution of the program. So, if you look at the execution of the program, you have a miss in M1 that is going to be fetched to set number 48 and then you have a miss in m4 that means the very first access happened to 49 and then there is the s1 whenever you have s1 then that is again a miss even though it is a compulsory miss but it has to evict out whatever was kept by m4 and then when it comes back to the main routine again m10 is another miss. So, every time you are going to run so this is going to be repeated 10 times so there are 22 misses plus there is two data misses they are also happening. There are two data items, they are also missing ones. How many cache block evictions happen during the execution of the program? So, eviction happen basically there is already there is a data and I am going to evict out. So, whenever I miss in S1, I evict the content that has been brought from M4. Like that for this loop, you have eviction. So, you have total of 20 evictions that is there. List out the block numbers in decimal in the cache that are non-empty after the execution of this program. So, it is uh, block number 0 and block number 16. These are the set numbers. Set 10 block is same in the case of direct mapped cache. So, set number 0 and set number 16 will have the data. And set number 48 and 49 will carry your main, sub main routine M and the subroutine S. So, this gives us a clear idea about what will happen whenever you run multiple programs. So, with that we come to the end of uh, uh, this tutorial on cache optimizations and OS role in mapping. So, just to summarize especially in the last problem. So, once you work out problems like this where multiple functions are being involved one function calling other and there can be uh, mapping issues when two functions are mapped onto the same cache block then there will be evictions. So, that will give you a concrete idea about how cache memory mapping happens. Thank you.